I welcome you to this, for this fifth class in our eight week congregational care series entitled Pilgrim's Progress Through the Pandemic from Coping to Adapting to Transforming. On our first four classes, for those of you who've been joining with us, we have uh, covered ethical tensions in the pandemic. We have covered coronavirus, research and vaccine. We've looked at biblical narratives and theology. We've learned about religious responses and Tennessee-based res historic responses to pandemics and epidemics through history. If you missed any of those classes, we invite you to go to your congregational email, the one that is sent out uh, on Saturdays includes links to all the previous classes that have occurred, as well as any of the PowerPoint presentations that have been shared. So please feel free to go to that email um, to see past classes. Today, we bring those topics home, right into our own congregation, our lives, our fellow members, where we work, where we play, where we learn, where we worship. We're focusing on the topic, adapting to the challenges of the pandemic across ages and stages. We're gonna look at some of these questions what has helped young children? What has helped teens, parents, educators, those working and learning remotely and in person? What's helped grandparents, retirees? What's helped move from merely coping and surviving to adapting and growing? What have the challenges been? What has been learned? Have depression or anxiety entered in? And how has growth been experienced or is currently evolving amidst this very trying time? And how does that manifest itself at different ages and stages of life? Has faith played a role in this movement from coping to adapting? Do you have hope? Do you see any possibilities for God's doing a new thing, providing transparency? transformation, moving us to become something new in this new world in which we're called to live and serve and be people of faith. These are some of the questions that we will be wrestling with today and more. And so before we begin and I introduce the panel, uh, please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God of all creation, we come before you on this second Sunday of Advent, walking our way to Bethlehem, weighed down by the increasing numbers of COVID cases, of all those sick, of all those who have died, and knowing that all these numbers represent beloved people, numbers that now are surging. And yet we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Get you up to a high mountain and proclaim the good news. For the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. So help us, God, to see in this present darkness with renewed vision and courage and hope and faith in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who showed us your face in a manger and upon the cross, and who meets us along the roads of our lives, including this pandemic road now. Help us to believe the good news, to live the good news, to act on the good news, for we are your people, and we open our hearts to you, O oh God, now and evermore. Amen. We are so grateful to our three panelists uh, today, three sets of panelists today. Beginning first, uh, and I will introduce them right prior to their time of speaking, beginning first with Melissa and Tony Threat. There they are, can you all see them? And if you wanna be on gallery view or if you want to go to speaker view, you will get the panelists in larger focus as they speak. 
Melissa and Tony have been members of Westminster for seven years. They have two children, Lillian in the third grade, Miles in the first grade. They are both at Waverly Belmont Elementary School and they are learning remotely now and have been ever since last spring. And they, along with Melissa and Tony, their remotely working parents um, are filling their home with laughter and joy, with learning and work. Melissa, an architect, Tony, an IT leader for a healthcare compliance startup. We are so grateful you are with us today. Melissa and Tony, we look forward to hearing how you are wrestling with those questions as parents, as full-time working folk, as people of faith. Take it away. Good morning. Morning. How's everybody? Good morning. Thank you for being here. Heidi, we weren't sure if you were going to prompt us with questions or if you first wanted us to just... Um, I want you to go forward with what you are sharing in response to those questions. Okay. Yeah, so you guys lead off. Okay. Um, we've been talking this week about, um, thank you, Heidi, for asking us to do this. And it's prompted conversation in our house that we've had in bits and pieces, but um, it's been nice to actually talk about. Um, one thing I say, said just this morning was that this year has not been linear in that coping, adapting, transforming. We've gone back and forth. Um, I think we knew that, but it was interesting to articulate that this morning. Um, we started all being at home on March 12th when Metro schools canceled um, school for the first time. You know, at the time it was for two weeks and for a month and for six weeks and who knows. Um, so for a while it was sort of surviving, but also enjoying being home. Um, Y'all probably know, but Metro didn't really do a whole lot of online instruction in the spring. It was really, here's some things you can do. Here's some websites if you want. We'll check in once a week and we're scrambling and we'll figure it out. So we are both working at home and it was a lot of just kids playing and doing a reading app now and then um, and then talking to their teacher once a week. Once it became summer, they would probably say it was their best summer ever, would you say? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, we did actually find a way to spend a month in Greenville, South Carolina, where our families are. Um, to continue to work uh, in a separate home from our parents, but then to be able to see family regularly, which was helpful. And that was certainly an adaptation um, and a gift because we wouldn't have otherwise done that. Our kids would have been in various Bible schools and music camp, we would have been tied to Nashville throughout the summer. Um, we also, I guess skipping, just talking about that really quickly, we did actually get, get to go to the beach over Metro fall break. They still honored the fall break, even though they were learning remotely, our kids were. Um, so that was a gift as well. We figured out how to do that, um, going to the South Carolina coast over fall break. Um, honestly, I'll just, I'll confess, Heidi, when you asked us to do this, my focus was solely on this school year from August to now. Um, not forgetting that this whole year has been a pandemic, but um, I think just that's been the, the hard part in this house has been August to now, not the spring and summer. Um, it's very segmented. So what I mean, you know, we're not we're not linearly just getting better at this whole thing as the year has gone on. We've gone back and forth. Um, do you want to talk about? Yeah, I that? think yeah, I think um, for us, it's it's definitely been uh, you know, school has really driven for us a lot of a lot of changes and and sort of where our perspective lies. I think even with this. This past school year, the, the last uh, since August, uh, for sure, the first quarter, which is, I don't know, we don't even know how long it is, honestly, it just kind of blends together, uh, was a big uh, adaptation period for us. But I think we're at the point now, I don't know if we want to call it transforming or not, but it is it is our reality and it will be our reality now. Uh, we've decided at least through the end of the school year, um, which is it's actually worked out well. I think our kids are what what is hopeful and um Great for us is that our kids have really thrived in this situation. Um, so even if we have bad days, even if we have situations where things are amok, uh, you know, we've we've said multiple times um, that it feels like a light bulb has gone off in our son Miles, who's in first grade. It, it, you know, who knows? Maybe it's just his time of of uh, growth and opportunity. But man, he has just I don't know. It, it's just a, it's, it's wonderful to see. So, you know, he's, he's writing more, he's doing, he's 
excelling in math. And we didn't know that was going to be a thing. <laughs> and uh, because he doesn't like to listen to uh, his school in headphones, we get to basically participate in first grade elementary school uh, every day, uh, whether we want to or not. Um, but but either way, it's, it's been wonderful to see his just exploration and explosion of, of intellect uh, over the over the last since August. Um, and I think now that we're, I guess, in second period or quarter or whatever, <laughs> yeah. wherever we are in the school year, um, you know, we've really, uh, this just has become our life. Um, I don't think we want this forever, right? I don't think we want to be, uh, you know, our kids not having the opportunity to be in elementary school and middle school and all that type of stuff. But for the time being, it, it has become, um, you know, a, a blessing. Uh, we do have a calendar where, we, where we've said how many weeks we've been home together. Uh, it's 39. It, it's 39. <laughs> but, uh, you know, while that was a, um, I don't know, probably a negative thing for the first 32 weeks, I think we've really seen it as a blessing, right? As a, as a, you know, I never had the opportunity to be with my parents uh, this much uh, as a kid. And, um, you know, I think we've really become a, I don't know, a better uh, family unit. We all, we all, when it's warm outside, we all sort of take a recess and a break in the afternoons and go hang out in the hammocks and, and enjoy, uh, enjoy the weather. Um, that's not something I would be doing at work, right? I'd probably have a meeting until five o'clock and I have to jump in the jump in the bus that I'd take the bus but anyway, and, and come, come home. And so, you know, having those moments of, of sort of seeing the world through their eyes has been, has definitely been a blessing. Um, and, and really the last thing, I guess, for me, um, you know, I, you know, Melissa nailed it on the head when she said that it's really been uh, sort of an ebb and flow of, of coping, adapting and, and transforming. Um, yeah. It, was, it wasn't really until she said that this morning that I was like, yeah, that that's kind of how our life has been. It, you know, whether it's, with family, it's been coping, or with, with work, it's been adapting, or, or whatever. I think it's definitely been a, for sure, for us, three different seasons uh, since since March, and, and obviously it will continue on. And um, you know, the, the place that I've, you know, one of the questions is, is where where have you found God? And and uh, for me, it's been uh, maybe surprisingly or not, it's it's been in nature, but it's been on the golf course. Uh, you know, being able to 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 walk around and and uh, get some physical activity, and and uh, just uh, serendipitously, I had an opportunity to play golf with a with a man named Fred <laughs> a couple of weeks back. Again, it was a random situation. I, I usually go play by myself, but just having the opportunity to talk with him. Um, and and talk not only about golf uh, or, or about where we're from, and surprisingly, we're we were from similar areas in the country, uh, but talking about family and, and what this time has meant uh, to, th to rethink what family means, uh, mm -hmm. to rethink what, what it means to, uh, you know, to, to I, guess, I guess, thrive, thrive in, thrive in this pandemic situation and what that, what that perspective means for us as we, as we move forward. Again, serendipitously, but it was, a, it was a wonderful conversation that really has changed some of the mm -hmm. conversations that Melissa and I have at home. Uh, about what we're where, where we are, where we're thinking, and and uh, you know, kind of what what family we want to be. So, again, it's been it's been uh, you know it's been a challenge, but it but it has been a blessing. And I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, sitting around the the Thanksgiving table. Luckily, again, we've been basically uh, uh, social distanced or physical distanced from from most everybody, not only in Nashville but but from our family. So we were able to go back and and have a Thanksgiving. But sitting around the Thanksgiving table with family, luckily, and and saying what we were thankful for. And, and one thing that my brother-in-law said, you know, this may not have been the 2020 we wanted, but it was the 2020 we needed. Uh, mm -hmm. and for us, that has been, that has truly ranked. That's true. Yeah. That's, that's been mm -hmm. truly, uh, mm -hmm. true, true. Not just Pollyanna. I mean, it really has <laughs> yeah. been, I think, what our family needed to pause and, and really think what, what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think as coming out of this, uh, you know, hopefully next summer, right, um, I think we'll be a different family than we are, uh, than we were in March of 2020. One thing y'all can't see is that our 13 year old toy poodle is here in our lap. His head is in my hand and his body is in Tony's lap. Um, we don't know how much longer he'll live. He's been with us since he was eight weeks old. And to have this year where we've been home every day, all day almost, um, I can count on probably two hands the times we've left him alone to go drive through Chick-fil-A or whatever. And um, he's just living his best life. And we're super grateful for that. That was um, certainly something we didn't see coming as well. Um, Heidi, you also asked about, and please, if you want to interrupt and guide us, Heidi, but you asked about um, what role faith has played. And I will not sit here and tell you all that I've had quiet time every day, that I've prayed six times a day um, or anything like that. But I can tell you that I have seen the body of Christ um, this year in a way that I didn't expect. Um, and it's many of you on here um, who have blessed uh, me and our family um, 
y'all know that I am chair of the new member committee and we had a group of new members we received over Zoom in May, um, a call meeting of the session that way. Um, it was different, but it's been amazing. Um, and to me, I guess I, I consider all of this, the Holy Spirit moving um, in this house and in me and in my relationships through my text messages and other apps that I've discovered that I wouldn't have been using otherwise. Um, that group of new members has become a weekly small group. We still meet during this hour. Um, and Heidi was continuing to be with us prior to y'all starting this class. And they have become dear friends and we've gotten to know one another. I feel like they've been members as long as I have. I feel like I've known them forever. Um, such a blessing. And I had some, a period of weeks when school started and it became so overwhelming. They had 30 minutes of PE homework. They had all these assignments that they had to do that's not something we would have had. Um, if they had been in school, they would have just done those classes. They've since pulled back on some of that, but I felt overwhelmed um, in a way that I hadn't felt since the beginning of the pandemic, I think. Um, Elizabeth Tribute came to our rescue and brought us dinner one night when I was really struggling. She could tell just over email um, that I was having a hard time and that was such a blessing for us and a relief. Um, it really took that whole first quarter to adjust to what it meant to, I think, just hearing their classes going on, trying to do our work, um, and then trying to get a handle on the homework because it wasn't very streamlined the way, it's not very streamlined the way it's uh, presented. So we finally figured that out. Our eight-year-old can pretty much do that herself now, which is helpful too. Um, and then I just wanna say that I've felt supported and held up by a small group of friends, uh, choir friends who have been there for me um, and we've been there for one another in such a special way. So um, that is just, a, I don't know, that's, it's an unexpected blessing to me. They were my people already, but they've been, they've become so much more and I'm so grateful for that. So uh, thank you all for, I know we all lift, lift up and uphold one another, all of us, um, you know, either by name or not. And we're grateful. Heidi, was there more you wanted us to? No, you guys uh, have covered so much so beautifully, and we're going to continue to engage with you and the other panelists in the discussion time that follows. The body of Christ manifested in so many ways, including right within your own family and in all the ways that you all have just lifted up. Thank you. Thank you. We go now to a next stage of development, and that's our teens. And we are so blessed as well to have our member, Jess Hill, who joined Westminster shortly after her marriage to Mo. You guys were married, I learned, at Westminster. Mo grew up at Westminster. And so, uh, Jess, you've been a part of the congregation since a, a roughly 1986, you've shared with me. You and Mo raised your three children at Westminster. For 10 years, you taught math at the Harpeth Hall School and served as the upper school director. You became head of the school, Jess did, and boy, did there, there was a shout that went up uh, from the Westminster community as you became head of school in 2018. Jess, we are grateful you will now share with us the needs of adolescents, how you have seen them grow and change and morph and merge during this lengthening pandemic and reflect on the significant roles that adults in their lives can play and whatever from this class topic questions you'd like to engage. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. I am, uh, can you hear me? Are we good? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, I just, I want to say there are probably so many experts on this, on this uh, Zoom today that, that know a lot about adolescence, so I will just add my voice to yours, I'm sure. Um, for some of you, it may have been a while since you had teenagers in your home, and for some of you, you may not have experienced that yet. So I'm going to start with reminding us some of, about some of the things about teens. And, um, and let, me, let me start with... Most psychological studies show that marriages are in their most stressful years when there is a teenager under your roof. So I just want to begin with parenting teenagers is, is challenging and, and hard without a, without a pandemic. And, and uh, some of the worries that go through our minds during, during these times are, you know, are they, are they going out too much? Why are they not going out enough? Why are they not being invited out enough? Um, 
Why does she always want to be alone in her room or his room? Uh, why does he only speak to me in one syllable answers? Mm -hmm. uh, these things when we're trying to connect with our teens and, and we're feeling that it's really hard. The second thing I want to remind us all of is that um, a teenager's job is to separate from their parents. Uh, this is this is what what they need to do. And so what I tell usually the parents of eighth to ninth grade students is they are going to fire you as their managers and they're going to rehire you as their consultants. And that's hard. That's hard for a parent who's used to um, managing and planning the play dates that they may have or calling a friend and saying, can you take her for a little while or him for a little while while I do this? Those things are all part of being a manager. When you're a consultant, your child comes in and just says, mom, I'm going over to so-and-so's house. Is that okay? They just check in with you. It's a, it's a very different role. One of the uh, one of the images I like to think of the most for teens, and it's a good reminder for, for parents and, and for educators, is that when things are going well, think of, think of your teenager in a swimming pool. So when things are going well, they're in the world that they need to be in. They're in their social world at school or in extracurricular activities or athletics or church groups. They are, they're swimming and they're doing fine. When things aren't going so well, they're going to swim up to the side of the pool and cling to the side of the pool. That's you. You're the side of the pool that they're going to come to. And when they do that, it feels really good as a parent when they come to you and they come to that side of the pool and they hold on. Um, but when they're feeling good again, they're going to push off from the side of the pool and go back into the pool and swim. That part can feel a little jolting. It's a little hard. And, and um, we really love it when they need us. It makes us feel good. But we have to remind ourselves that when they don't need us, that's when things are going best. Um, and that's that's sort of hard for us to, to sometimes feel um, like that loving parent when they don't need, it, need us as much. The third thing to remember, so this is just in normal times, because I think sometimes in COVID, we, we recognize these things more and they, they feel more acute to us, but um, a teenager's need for privacy is real. Uh, that, that doesn't mean when your son or daughter goes into their room and closes the door that they're doing something necessarily bad. They probably just want to maybe watch a silly cartoon or YouTube video. They might want to call a friend. It just means they want to be by themselves when they do it. And so, so to respect that privacy is an important part of being a parent during this time. Obviously, we'll talk a little bit about when that might be might go too far. But those are just some things to remember about healthy teenage years and parenting those, those teens. And then when we add COVID to the list, uh, parent, parenting teens was hard. It just got harder. Um, as parents, our list of worries is much longer. Uh, we have stresses about our own careers or money or jobs on top of things. We're worried that our, our child may not be learning enough through whatever school system they're in. Are they learning enough online? Is that really what they need for them to go on to college? Um, we may be worried that they can't make new friends. Maybe they've just transitioned to a new school and they're not able to make new friends. Um, maybe we're worried that uh, the that the transition and the connection with teachers is not going well. We may be worried about a college search. We may be worried about a college, the search itself, and we may be worried about what they're heading into or what we may be paying for with college and what kind of experience they'll have. We're probably mourning right alongside our, our students some of the things they're missing. It might be a big concert or recital. It may be a big uh, football game or basketball year for that, for that child. Um, all of these things we mourn right along with them. They didn't maybe get to do their prom, their junior or senior prom or some other school event that's important to them, a chance to be in a play. Um, it's important um, for us to let the students take the lead on that though, sometimes they bounce back a little more than we do. We know that we have certain memories about these occasions. For them, they're, they're swimming along, they're moving along and this is life as they know it. And so they don't have it, they're not comparing it to whatever our experience was with those, with those events. So that's, that's an important reminder, I think. 
Um, there's some good news here. I think, I think one of the things that to remember is our sons and daughters during these years are much more resilient than we may think they are. Uh, they, they can bounce back pretty quickly. So that goes along with let them lead the way, let them show you how they're able to do that. They really want to be included in this. I think if we try to shield them too much of all that's going on with the pandemic, uh, as a teenager, they're, they're going to not like that. They want to know what's going on. They want to have conversations with you about it. They want to know the reality because they also are going to want to engage in helping in some way that they can. Uh, many girls and, and boys at this age or young men and women struggle with school. And, I, and I'm not talking about academic struggle here. I'm talking about um, students that, you know, school is a very extroverted place. And so some, some students range from true social anxiety of going to school to just being an introvert and really getting worn out with going to class day after day. So the good news here is that Zoom has provided a platform for many students to engage in a way that feels very comfortable to them. Uh, you have to use that mute button for that student that sometimes dominates the classroom. And so sometimes that introvert is able to be on that level playing field in a, in a new and better way. Um, and, and although Donovan talked very well about the, the, um, the struggles and the things that we worry about with social media, and I, I certainly did with my own teenagers, and I know we all worry about the screen time and all those things. I think it's good for us to divide social media into, into three buckets. Uh, one being social media that's about connection. So just what we're doing right now, this is technology, but we're connecting with each other through technology. Uh, we can connect with our friends, with our family members, with people that are out of town. That connection is really important. Uh, the second part of creativity, I mean, the second part of uh, social media that's, that's important is creativity. These teens have learned how to create things. And if we think about it in a positive way, it is a very creative endeavor. Uh, videos and things like that, they can be funny, they can be positive, they can be not so positive. But those are some good things about social media that I think our teens are doing really well. Um, the negative part is the consumption part. The part where they're scrolling through, they might go down the rabbit hole into something that they, they is really negative. Um, certainly pornography is one of the things mentioned today, but, but there are other things that can, that can just take them away from their normal lives that are, that's not productive. So the consumption part of social media, I think is the part that, um, that is really concerning. Uh, I don't know, this is just something that came to mind. I don't know if any of you have seen the documentary social, um, social dilemma, I guess that's the name of it. I think that's the name of it, uh, about social media and the, and the, um, just the way it operates with us being the product. I think that's a really um, important, important documentary to watch. But, but it is important to realize that, that that connection through social media can be a lifeline for your teens. So remember what we said at the beginning, teens really are about separating from their parents right now. And now they're in the home with parents probably working from home. And that is the last place they want to be. They want to be separate from their parents. So it is a way for them to connect with, with other friends during this time. Um, I, th I think, I don't want to paint a completely rosy picture though. Uh, stress and anxiety is, is certainly part of this time. Now, when we say those words, we, we think of negative things with stress and anxiety. One thing to remember is stress and anxiety is is important in a natural and normal response to things. We need our teens to feel stressed when they walk into a party and people are making choices that they don't feel comfortable, comfortable about. That stress and anxiety is a good thing. It protects them. It makes them call you and say, hey, can you come pick me up? That's, that's good. So it's all stress and anxiety is not bad. A little stress before the test gets you a little bit amped and ready to go for the test. That's not always a bad thing. But right now, we all, as parents, as adults, as teens, are experiencing chronic stress. 
we've now been stressed so long since March in, in different ways. And I, and I think that we said it very well that, that it, it doesn't happen constantly, but it comes and goes. So it's now, it's, it, it's a cumulative thing. So we're all stretched thin uh, and, and our patience is short. And that makes it that makes it hard. Our patients is short, and so are our teens um, patients short. Uh, so, so some of the things we can do, we can, uh, and I think it's very real when when talking about uh, metro or independent schools changing their schedules, being remote, being in person, being in hybrid. That causes stress and routine is incredibly important for people to maintain some sort of feeling of being in control. Uh, and, and so if, if your routine is changing, just try to be almost, I hate to use the word militaristic about it, but create another routine. I think, I think as soon as you can, if it's Tuesday that you connect on Zoom with your child that's in college, or if it's uh, Sunday that you connect with grandparents or whatever it is, go for the walk in the park on the certain day. Those kinds of routines are really important for families. And I think, I think that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, there, there are positive coping strategies and there are negative coping strategies. Um, and so, so some of the negative coping strategies, I think we can all imagine, uh, that's, that's that emotional retreat. So when your child just doesn't just go to their room here and there to, to be, have some alone time, but they completely retreat from you even when they are physically present. Um, substance misuse is certainly a negative coping strategy. Junk habits, watching junk on TV. I mean, we all sort of have our moments of binge watching something, but, but um, that sort of eating in an unhealthy way. And then mistreating others. Uh, teenagers have, have a tendency to be snarky sometimes, but, but I think you can tell when it's not just a momentary thing, uh, when they're truly not being themselves. That's where we have to watch out for that. Um, the positive, the positive coping strategies, social connections that are real, those connections with friends, where the friend is there to listen to them, um, where they feel accepted, uh, and then happy distractions from COVID, uh, reading, creating something, doing something with family members. Some of the students uh, with whom I work have said that one of the best parts of COVID is that they've really spent time with a younger sibling, which they wouldn't have done. And they've really gotten closer to their siblings during this time. Um, I think, I think that the most important thing that as a church or a school we can do is help them get out of themselves and do something for someone else. Mm -hmm. So as I said earlier, these teenagers want to help and, and anytime they can, they can reach out and, and, and if it's their idea to help a certain group of people, that really helps as well. Um, but just doing something for someone else is so therapeutic and it can really help them feel uh, needed and it can, it can give them that, that positive endorphin that they need when, they, when they've been in isolation for so long. Um, I also wanna just take a minute to say, girls and boys can be so different in the way that they deal with stress. And, and here I'm talking in broad generalities because certainly there are girls that react the way boys do and there are boys that react the way girls do. But, but sometimes boys can be healthier in the way that they react to stress. And, and, you know, we worry because boys don't tend to talk as much and share as much. But if they're feeling stressed, they may call a friend and say, let's go shoot basketball um, or, or let's go for a run or let's go do something. So they do something active. Sometimes girls can get more stressed about the fact that they're feeling stressed. So they're, they're, they start to feel anxious and then they go into the school counselor and they say, I'm feeling really anxious that I'm starting to feel anxious. So it compounds and they tend to talk to each other about it, which is great, but then it can raise the level of stress if, depending on who they call and who they, who they share that with. So just something to keep in mind now. Um, I think also we can all expect meltdowns more often. Uh, we think about meltdowns with two-year-olds, but it's very similar to a meltdown with a 15 or 16-year-old. I think we have meltdowns when our patience is thin. Uh, sadness is to be expected. And I think it's okay to allow 
for sadness and disappointment without immediately using that word depressed. So being careful to allow for that, for that emotion of sadness without feeling like, oh my goodness, I think, I think she or he is clinically depressed. So to remember that depression is a biochemical disorder and it, and it, it is true. There are more teenagers who are feeling isolated and depressed during this pandemic. So some of the things to watch for uh, for depression is avoidance or disengagement with others, um, making sure they don't go too long with avoiding conversations or engagement there. Um, avoidance feeds anxiety, so it just makes it worse. Missing schoolwork or deadlines, that's something their teachers are going to be on top of, but just for you to also help with. Um, when they're not themselves, and you, and you know better than anyone when your teen is not themselves, that prickliness that turns into snarkiness that just doesn't go away when there's not that apology that comes back around later. Um, and then making sure you lay eyes on them. Sometimes even though we may be working at home, we may be on Zoom when they're re ready to connect or vice versa. So just making sure you have that, that connection and, and laying eyes on them is important. Um, as parents, it's so hard. You, you can tell I'm giving you a lot of advice right now. It's hard not to give advice to our teenagers, but it's really important to listen more than to talk and to try to avoid using the five words that I know I used to use often with my teenagers. And that is when I was your age. Try not to start anything with when I was your age, because really when we think about it, there is nothing that that happened when we were their age that is similar to living through a pandemic right now with social media and all of the changes that they have. So that, that's a real showstopper sometimes when we start conversations with that. And then um, I think the other thing too is when your teenager is opening up and they're saying something that's really shocking to you. Um, sometimes a mask can come in handy so it, so it covers your facial expression, but I think it's just really important if you can to say something that feels natural to you, but something like, tell me more about that. I want to, I want to learn more about that. Um, to try not to have that first reaction of, oh my gosh, what are you telling me? This is so horrifying. You know, these things that we're thinking in our mind, the bubble over our head is saying that, but we try not to come out with that. Um, the, the other things I think for us to, this is not what this Sunday school class is about, but it's just important to realize, I think, in my, in my 25 years of being an educator, I have never seen students as engaged, and this is true nationally, not just in our school, um, I've never seen students as engaged in what's going on in the world. So not only is the pandemic and COVID an overlay of everything, but we can't discount the fact that the racial issues, the social justice issues, and then the political issues all intertwined with that are very much affecting them as well. So I think those three things, the social justice issues, the, the politics that, and, the, and the conversations around that, and then COVID, those three really are probably, you could say all of these things that I've said about all three of those issues, um, they're, they're having a really strong effect on them. So um, that, is, that is pretty much all I have to say. Um, I, I do want to say that, um, that I'm grateful that there are so many students in our church that have um, faith, that we have faith. I can't imagine going through this time without it. We've lost control, so now we know that there's someone else there to guide us and take care of us. Oh, yes, beautiful. Yes, thanks be to God for that, Faye. Thanks for all that you shared, and I know we'll get into more in a few minutes. Um, I think it pertains to a lot of us. What you said about the teens, uh, I took also as, as learning for myself and helping me be self-aware. Thank you. Lokeel and Joe Gaines will join us next. Lokeel and Joe joined Westminster in 1984. They raised their two children uh, at Westminster, now mm -hmm. retired. They are very active at church and in the community and as grandparents. 
In their careers, Lokeel served in communications with a trade association, and Joe was assistant commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. Having risen in those ranks to that high level over his years with the department, and uh, one of the highlights was that Joe helped establish the Pick Tennessee Products Program. So Joe and Lokeel, we welcome you now to speak about how you have experienced and are experiencing this time. Joe and Lokeel? Well, thank you, Heidi and Sylvia for inviting us. And um, one of the things that I've taken through this series that we, that uh, you all have offered, Heidi, is uh, I have learned so much from these uh, each of these Sunday school classes. Uh, Jess, man, I wish I had, I wish I had your ear when our kids were teenagers, gosh. <laughs> and Melissa and Tony, I really admire how well mm -hmm you all have adapted to where you are with your work and your children. And uh, it's, ju it's just amazing. Um, our focus a little is more of what Heidi and Sylvia asked us to do is more about how we have, um, uh, how we've sort of worked our way up to where we are now in the pandemic. So I'll start out um, with, my perspective. And um, I remember so vividly um, in early March, and we knew something was going to happen, but I had no concept of what this pandemic was going to do to our country. I mean, and, and quite honestly, I'm almost glad I was that naive because mm -hmm. I just, uh, it's, it's over, it's been overwhelming. I'll just say that it's been overwhelming, but anyhow, um, I serve, um, on sort pack and move, which is a ministry, uh, that works through home connection mm -hmm. and, um, I, this is just such a vivid memory for me. Uh, Aileen Payton and I had gone to visit with a client. There had been a professional, um, this client, it was an elderly couple plus her uh, disabled brother who lived with them. And they had just, they lived in a very nice condo, but they had just accumulated too much stuff. And uh, they needed to declutter. And that's part we don't just move people, but we also will go in and help declutter. So a professional had come in and gotten the job started and had a plan of action. And Aileen and I had gone over in early March and um, we were set to go back a week later and complete this project so that this um, family, this family was not living in clutter and um I remember our visit was over I took Aileen back to the church to where her car was and we got home and Mayor Cooper had issued a stay-at-home order um and so I called our client Mrs. Her name isn't Smith, but I called Mrs. Smith and I said, and they're elderly and um, Joe and I are pushing elderly. And um, I said, I, <laughs> I said, um, I don't think I need to come next week. I said, what if I call you back in two weeks? And she said, yeah, I think that that's a good idea too. Cause they were, she was so excited about getting this job done. And for me, this is the really harsh reality we never went back. Mm -hmm. That's been the heart. And Jess, one of the things that you meant, said just a minute ago that I wrote down, uh, helping someone else, that has been really significant for both Joe and me in our retirement years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 
you know, it, it's, it, it, it has had an impact on, on, uh, on us, not being able to be in service to others. Okay. Uh, well, as Oak Hill mentioned, <clears throat> Jess and the Threats, uh, <clears throat> I really <clears throat> enjoyed and appreciated your comments. And uh, it made me reflect back some to when we were in those situations. I, I do remember when we carried our first child, Amanda, into a home, uh, I thought, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> uh, I could have benefited a lot from your information. <coughs> uh, we both retired as soon as we could, I guess fairly early. Uh, and one of our objectives was to travel. I mean, we enjoy travel. We like being with the people we know. We've done several of the church uh, or travel activities, guys' pilgrimages. Uh, we had a, um, a, another trip planned with some other friends of ours, uh, the Crowns being, being a couple. Uh, we were gonna go to France and Belgium and view some areas that were there. Well, the pandemic occurred. And of course we lost tread at the same time. And, and the first thing, our travel plans were uh, for the year and possibly more were interrupted. And then secondly, we lost a very good friend, a dear friend, uh, uh, Fred Crown. And one of the things that struck me in, in the pandemic is that we're really not able to celebrate his life as a group as we've always done. Uh, to get together in the sanctuary and to talk and laugh and, and, and appreciate our friendship. And Fred is certainly one that comes to mind, but just think of the others, Tom, Graham, and John Boone, and, you know, just, I, I could go on, I could go on with, with those names. So that, that's been something that uh, uh, I, I would say has really been an impact of, of the pandemic. Uh, we, as Lokil mentioned, we try to stay busy with different volunteer activities. Uh, we had just, we had a mission trip planned to go to the Gulf Coast uh, uh, in March. And of course that was canceled. I think it was made, but I think it was canceled pretty early. We had the tornado that hit Nashville and Cookville and Mount Juliet and other places. and. We were able as a group just to do some very preliminary work, <clears throat> but then the pandemic <clears throat> isolations occurred. So we were not able to do, do those things. So those have certainly been uh, impactful as far as, uh, you know, our lives and what we do. Uh, we, love our kids and, and even with all the challenges and rocky roads and other things we were able to raise two good kids through their teenage years and through the college years however when uh, grandkids start popping up it moves you to another level you know another level of love and appreciation uh well we were very active with them they were kind of within our isolation cell well, Amanda and her husband both developed COVID and with these two small kids in their home. So, uh, you know, I, I think we both prayed probably stronger than, than we have in our entire lives for their well being. Mm -hmm. They have since uh, uh, recovered, uh, recovered and, and are doing well. Uh, our granddaughter had a touch of it, but she's doing well. She starts back to school <laughs> next Monday. Uh, we ran the COVID Express. You know, Amanda would call in uh, to Kroger and she'd fiddle a list, we'd pull up and they'd load us up and we'd go and stand in the front driveway with them in the, in the doorway and uh, uh, you want to run up and hug them and everything, but you know, you just couldn't do it. Uh, so we, we helped in that way. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll let Lokil talk some. <laughs> well, 
one of the things that uh, we did decide early on um, was to stay involved with our children and our grandchildren. And um, honestly, we knew that that would be a risk. Uh, our son-in-law is a physician. Our daughter, um, at the time the children were in preschool, our granddaughter has since started into kindergarten this fall. Um, but we just needed to, we needed to have that connection. It was not one that neither Joe nor I, nor Amanda and Patrick and the kids were willing to give up. Um, we knew it would be risky. Uh, we were very fortunate when they got sick. We had not been around them in about a week. So we never got sick. And I'm very, I'm grateful to God that we did not get sick. Uh, because I really do feel like uh, we were able to help them a lot because Amanda and Patrick were both sick at the same time. So when one was just feeling miserable, the other one was having to take care of the three-year-old and the five-year-old. And it's hard to watch that and not be able to help. Um, but anyhow, that be that as it may. Um, one of the questions that we were asked, how have you shifted from coping to adapting? And that's been interesting. Um, it's, um, I think maybe, uh, I like the term that Melissa used, linear. I think probably for us, it has been a little bit more linear than it can be for someone who's taking care of children or taking care of someone else, whether you know, you're know you taking care of a parent or, or whomever. I, th I think ours has been more linear. And, it, and like I said at the beginning, I needed this gradual progression into COVID because if I had any idea early on how long this was gonna last, mm -hmm. That might have, that would have, that would have been very hard for me. Um, it's, it was, um, I needed, I, I, I needed to, I, I've often said, I, lots of times I'm the ostrich, I put my head in the sand. And, I, and with that, I needed my head to be in the sand, to be able mm -hmm. to cope with it, to be able to uh, get to the point where we are. Uh, this summer, we took a couple of brief little trips. It was just the two of us uh, in the car just to break up the scenery. That helped a lot. Uh, I have not done any projects. I have not been motivated to do a single project. I admire all of you who have done projects. Uh, but one thing I have learned to do is I have started baking bread and that has been fun. <laughs> so as long as you can find bread flour, I, uh, and sometimes you can't find bread flour, but I have enjoyed that. Go ahead. Well, I think I'll close this out unless we'll kill no, because something she really wants to oh, say. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting uh, it, it, when you live together for 40, 50 years, whatever it may be. Maybe it didn't take some people that long, but you recognize differences in people uh, during this, co uh, this pandemic that we've got. I'm the type, I'm like the turtle. I, I can withdraw into my shell. I can get me a few books. Uh, you know, I can watch a movie on TV. I can kind of just hunker down and, and, you know, make things through. Locale well, is just the opposite. You know, she's the bird's sitting on top of the fence post, just singing to the world. Well, she she's on three or four church committees uh, and uh, she's a member of every book club, I think on this side of town. So every evening there's a Zoom going and people laughing. And one of them is I think a think and drink club and, and, and they talk about books and, and I guess they drink wine while they Zoom, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but she's always laughing and cutting up. So I, I guess we learn those two things about each other and hopefully we respect those two differences. So, yeah. and, and I have one other, one last thing to say. Uh, and this is about our, my faith. 
And uh, I have to tell you, um, Jess, I think you said it too, um, how, how one is able to get through this time without faith, I just don't know, because my faith really has sustained me. Mm -hmm. But um, every, I, first of all, Heidi, I, I'm going to brag about this. I have never had better church attendance than I have had during the pandemic. <laughs> I, uh, we get up, I might be in my pajamas, I might not be, not going to say, I'm drinking my coffee. We've got the television on. We can watch the church service on the television. We sing off key. We respond together. Uh, and I will tell you, every Sunday, I am uplifted. There has not been a Sunday during this pandemic that I absolutely has not have not been up, uplifted. And it is, it really is a highlight for me. Uh, it has kept me connected and uh, I am so, so grateful for what our church staff has done during this pandemic. And, and I know that you all will continue the bar just, you all just keep setting that bar higher and higher. And I am, mm -hmm. I am so grateful for what you all have done. Each one of you, each one of you, Heidi, we yeah. thank you. Well, uh, but thank you to you all. And, and, and we do do it together, right? That's what body of Christ means. Um, and I think we, as Paul said it in Philippians, we uphold one another, right? You play your part. We play our part. We are getting through this time together because of how we uphold one another in faith and mutual support and encouragement. It means so much. Friends, we want to have a robust time and we invite everybody to continue on this call. If you need to leave at some point, please know we understand. But Melissa and Tony, uh, Jess, Joe and Lokeel, their stories may have prompted things in you all, questions that you'd like or comments you'd like to make in response to what they shared and or um, as well some comments you'd like to make out of your own lives. So we have just had from Catherine McElroy, amen to what Lokeel just said. We are so grateful to the church staff for providing all the ways to connect with each other. Trish Mixon, absolutely agree. Marie Chopin, I also agree. Thank uh, Theresa Curl, thank all of you. Now we shift to the panel, thank you. Thank all of you for sharing your unique, your unique pers uh, perspectives. You are all treasures. All five of you who have just shared on Zoom, we thank you. So what has this spurred in those of you listening and those whose faces I don't see may still be in their pajamas, but feel free to speak or to send a chat question or comment or come, come right into the conversation. Because mm -hmm. this is about all of us, friends. We all are making this journey and we're doing it together from different ages and stages. Do I hear somebody coming forth? I have a question. Please, I, George, George Luscombe. Um, both for, you know, you know, maybe uh, Jess and, uh, you know, Melissa, and, but what challenges have um, people encountered either yourselves or people, you know, your friends of balancing um, your work and careers with having uh, children at home and dealing with their, their virtual uh, school, uh, et cetera. Melissa, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I don't know what you would say about that. I know we're lucky. So Tony is often on um, Zoom meetings and I am not. So um, Heidi said, I'm an architect. So I'm often emailing and then drawing, um, creating something to send out to someone, receiving something from someone, looking at it. Um, all of that can be done with interruption. It is harder, um, George, but it is okay. Um, 
when Tony has a call, he's usually sharing the kitchen table with Miles. So he's in first grade doing his work. Tony's in, sitting in the first grade classroom. Um, when he has a call that he needs to talk, he will come in here um, and close the door. And so I know that I need to be listening. Um, I'm glad I think that that's the case. If I were needing to be on the phone more or on calls more, it would be a lot harder because Miles is self-sufficient with his technology finally. Almost. <laughs> uh, one of us needs to be listening out. He might um, get the wiggles and jump down and I'll say, hello, get back, you know, go back up there or whatever. Um, I'm super grateful that um, only one of us has that. And it's not every day that you have that. Yeah. I, yeah. For us, it's, I think we are very blessed that mm -hmm. we both get to work from home. I don't, I don't know uh, how folks would do it if I had, if I had to go to the office or if, if we had to work from, from not being at home. I think the one thing that we're able to do, which I know not a lot of folks have that opportunity is not only, uh, you know, are we, in, are, are we in the same room basically, but we're able to tag team. So there are times when I'm able to uh, be more present or even just not work, right? I've, I've, I've set a situation where I, I try to stop at three o'clock at least, if not maybe a little bit earlier to make sure that Melissa has time to get her work done. And I'm, I'm then uh, making sure that the kids are doing what they, they need to do. So, you know, I, I think we are unique in that situation. And, and you know, I definitely have for sure thoughts and prayers for those who don't have our, who have our uh, lucky uh, situation yeah. of, of being, being all home and basically in one room together. We have many friends um, in our school community and Westminster friends as well who have to work outside the home, whether they're a physician, a teacher themselves or whatever. Um, and I know that the, some of those folks chose to go in person when given the option in October and then now Metro is back to virtual again. And I know that's a struggle. I'm really grateful we are not in that position. We felt like we could keep our kids home and safer uh, because we have this way of working. Jess, what do you want to? Yeah, Tony and Tony and Melissa have a great example of, of making it work. And I and I think as as students are older, I think I think that um, for parents it, it gets a little complicated because sometimes that student doesn't want you in the room when they're on the on the Zoom with their class. The other thing I think it's important to to point out is um, so many families don't have great infrastructure don't have the don't have the technology in their homes they they maybe the the older student who's the teenager has to take care of the younger student because the parent is at work um, there are a lot of demands on on many families and we have that at our school as well and so making sure we can do anything we can to support those families when we know about those things um, is very important George, thank you for prompting that good and additional sharing uh, from Jess and Melissa and Tony. I wanna lift up a comment from Sylvia Lyons and I wanna tell all on the call that it's mm. the task force that has been planning these classes on behalf of congregational care are Sylvia Lyons and Glenn Davidson. I wanna lift up Glenn as well on this call and myself. Um, and I want to share uh, Sylvia's comment. I cannot wait to send this recorded class to our adult children, for they have young children and teens. And the other piece that you all have spoken to, and Joe and Lokeel, you as well. What does it mean to know each other as couples? And while Mo, you didn't speak during the presentation, you're included in this as well, my friend Mo Hill. What does it mean to know each other as couples together in this time of COVID, right? Whether we're presently raising children or teens or are in retirement, what does that mean? And as Sylvia says, your faith, you all on the panel, your resilience, your honesty, your advice are priceless. So, so I would lift that up as as we journey to as couples, right? We mm -hmm. had each of you focused on ages and stages, but it's also about, and I think Joe, actually, it's where you concluded how you've come to know each other as both the turtle, and I love that phrase, the bird who, who sings on the fence post, right? You're low keel. How are we journeying through this time also as couples, right? How do we remain honest with ourselves, with each other, with our families, with our employers? Our work colleagues, you know, how, how, because we all are experiencing this, we on staff have had more people uh, sharing with us their experiences of anxiety and getting help for it in this time. We've also had some sharing experiences of addiction 
and, and now getting help for that. So this pandemic has brought out so much mm. in so many uh, and is prompting some, some real honesty, but also some real healing. Beth Drake, you just came in to the conversation. Would, what would you like to lift up? I'm gonna unmute me. Um, you know, I was just curious, especially with our young families, I'm on knitting and crocheting with a lot of our older ones and we're having a blast, by the way. Every Tuesday for two hours, we just talk away and have such a good time. Um, but our young families, we, we just don't get to see you. How best for us to reach out and help the young families with children and especially since we can't see you, what could we do? We appreciated your direct message um, a minute ago about that, Beth. And we were saying um, for us, I think we would need to think about that. We feel supported. Um, I, don't, I don't feel right now that we are lacking because we have finally grown into that adapting that I was so anxious we wouldn't get to for so well, long. I guess, do you know of others in the church that um, are you connecting as young families in the church? Are you knowing what the needs are of other young families? A little bit, a little bit. I think um, other young families might be connecting um, more. I will say that um, part in my new member small group, as well as the brand new crop that we're receiving a week from now, um, there are many families with new babies who've been born during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, April, June, July, September, um, yeah, and I, I would honestly say that they are the ones who we should um, reach out to and kind of think of um, more. I'm sure that if I given five minutes off of this call, I could think of some folks with school age kids who we could support because but of that. Maybe something we can contact with Sophie if. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, my dear friend Raquel. About meals or about yeah, yeah. things that we can drop off. Beth, I'd love to just share that our Congregational Care uh, Steering Committee, we've just launched a Families with Children mm -hmm. uh, Care Ministry. Katie Lee and I, and we've just had incredible recruitment response this past week, and then we do work in conjunction with Sophie. Yeah. But I think you're both speaking to the needs for us to ramp this up. Mm -hmm. This need is critical right now. And um, Beth, thank you for lifting that up. As it, it especially acute for our people with uh, young babies. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what what you what brought to mind, Beth, when you asked that. Really, for us, I think, or for me, is the the folks with babies. Um, it's such an isolating period, anyway, and then to feel like you have nowhere to go. And um, I know it's been invaluable for the two couples in our small group who have new ones. So um, happy to share specifically who those are with anyone who would like to know. Or even if there was a, a place for them to go to, if there was a small group Zoom for <laughs> parents with babies. That would um, be amazing. I could name six. Yeah. Yeah. But, yep. Yeah. I could list you six people right now who would love that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So Beth, let's stay in touch on this because you've touched on a true need in our congregation. Thank you. We, need, we want to grow it. Amy Dennison wants to say a word, and I see our ECO, and I'm guessing what the rest of the word is. Recovery. That's exactly what I guess the word was. Amy Dennison, please. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm not much of a typist, am I? <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, certainly there have been uh, situations within our church where addiction has been a problem and that kind of thing. I am... Um, a person, Heidi, as you know, who's in recovery. I've got um, 21 years uh, in recovery. Uh, yeah, which is just fantastic. Um, and it's the best thing in the world. It, it's been the best thing that ever happened to me. What I wanted to say is if there's anybody um, on this class right now, or if there's anyone who knows of another person who's having difficulty with this, I am available. There have been um, the recovery community in Nashville, Tennessee has been incredible. There are Zoom meetings all over the place. Um, you know, AA, Al-Anon, all of it uh, is available. If you guys, you know, run across anybody who's in trouble, there's definitely uh, help. And this is a rough time for people who are looking for help for that kind of thing. You have to do that on a Zoom call. So uh, just FYI. 
Amy, that's beautiful. Thank you for, for sharing that so directly. You have been helpful so many times in sharing that with this group today. Uh, that is a very powerful sharing that you, you have just shared with us. Um, Heidi. I'd yes, like please, mention, Sylvia Lyons. I'd like to mention too that Congregational Care is hoping to begin a new um, caring group for caregivers because not only are they isolated so much, even if it's not during the time of COVID, caring for people with dementia or Alzheimer's or chronic illnesses, if we could get a support group together. If you all know of anyone who would benefit or who would like to be involved, if you could let Heidi or, or myself know. Beautiful. Thank you. I think Sylvia, your point for caregivers, just like Melissa and Beth were making people with new babies, the experience of isolation when you're in a high caregiving mode with an infant, with a sick family member, with dementia or Alzheimer's in the home is only increased, right? Because of the pandemic. And so stepping up our care for one another and support is critical. Sylvia, thank you for bringing that up. Glenn Davidson, do you have a, a, a question, a comment that you would like to share? Well, my comment is it's just, uh, I can't believe how well this panel has worked out. It, it, it has exceeded I think our expectations on just how insightful it is for all of us. I, I do want to pick up on uh, something that Jess uh, suggested, and uh, it is the move from what we're experiencing in the pandemic as chaos, which required us to find adaptive um, uh, ways of handling it. But I think the quick way of moving beyond adaptation to transformation is to begin to think in terms that we overcome chaos through patterns. And one way we can use the term pilgrimage is um, to use the term, we're pattern seekers. Hmm. And this is where it becomes so important, I think, that we are able to share with one another to see what has worked, what has not worked within those that we trust. It also means connecting with our tradition, the patterns that have been part of what we may call faith. And that as we look forward then say to next week's uh, presentation to really see how our congregation has been responding to various uh, uh, other various challenges uh, to see what are those kinds of patterns that really give us the kind of um, good news that Donovan spoke of in, in his sermon today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Beautiful, and that, that really does link well and launch us uh, toward where we're going in the next two weeks, Glenn. You, uh, I heard you, you use the word, uh, uh, Jess, militaristic uh, about setting patterns though also, right? Glenn, you're reminding us to claim the patterns already in our lives, the friendship, the faith, the family, but also um, live those patterns, right? Claim them and live them to bring some structure amidst chaos. Yes. Yes. Another piece I thought you were gonna pick up on was um, the, the piece of being other regarding. Jess, you spoke to, and, and so did Joe and Lokeel, uh, the importance of, of helping others, of reaching out, of helping teens, uh, as well as all of us adults move into a, uh, seeing the needs of others. And I'm reminded Melissa and Tony, and I'm uh, gonna turn this over to Maurice in a second. Uh, about how um, your daughter Lillian and a dear friend shared sort of a best friend's necklace, the two halves of a necklace and what it meant to be able to care for one another and to see one another. And they worried about a member of their class together and reached out to that person. So for all ages and stages, living out of empathy and other regard makes a difference in how we cope and how we adapt and how we grow resilience. Marie Chopin, you have something you'd like to say? Oh, no, it's, I was just gonna say that um, after today hearing the three different perspectives about young children and teenagers and then uh, grandchildren, 
um, even even the fact that positives and negatives were pointed out, and thankfully they were. Um, I, I do feel more like um, more hopeful, really, even after today, about going forward. And um, what other people have already said um, to I, I find have found myself doing helping others more. And I realized I was in the grocery store earlier trying to get the um, the needs to to drop off at the church yesterday, and I found myself doing taking much more care than I ever would have. I just I mean I wanted it felt like I wanted to be perfect. But anyway, today. And, and the more we can collaborate like this, and and I, you know, I love all my friends here. Just uh, today's comments from everybody were just really helpful going forward. Oh, I um, I don't want to cut anybody off, but Maurice, I think you've given us a, a great place to pull this together because that's where we're moving in the next couple of weeks. Is how can we collaborate? The new idea that Beth threw out by connecting with Melissa, your own owning of helping more, the tools that Joe and Lokeel and Jess, Melissa and Tony gave us. How is God speaking to us to lead us in this time? And uh, I'm, I'm forgetting which one of you said it, uh, or maybe it was in Donovan's sermon today. Uh, everything merges, but we've got to live right where we are, right? The people who walked in darkness were walking in darkness, heard the message of comfort, but the comfort came in the midst of the darkness and the exile, right? We can't escape where we are. The faithful call is to live where we are, right? And to be led into these new and transformative places of loving and serving and being with the God who walks right alongside of us. I'm hearing you all doing that in deep and insightful and wise ways. We've done it more deeply, insightfully and wisely today because of the presence and witness of Melissa and Tony Threat, of Jess Hill and of Joe and Lokeel Gaines, the presence of all of you on the call and all of you have spoken and commented. Um, the people are walking, yes, and God is walking with us and the light is coming. Thanks be to God for each of you. Thank you to our five panelists today. We hope that you will join with us again next Sunday. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments or ideas for how we can continue to evolve, not just in this series, but through our ministry at church and with and for one another in the world, please be in touch. God bless you and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the world. And thanks be to God that we are the body of Christ known as Westminster Presbyterian Church in this place and time. Grateful for each of you. God bless. Thank, God bless. You. Thank you. Goodbye. God bless.